Hey, what's up, guys? We're joined by Eric Backage, the Michigan head baseball coach. He's got a nice little wallpaper background here. Aaron has uh, the old school Rosenblatt, and I have TD Ameritrade. But we're here to talk about the new college baseball model. Uh, we've all had a lot of time and, and whatnot to kind of put our thoughts down. And, and, and Eric and a group of Power 5 coaches have put together kind of a new college baseball model. We've seen uh, in the past, you know, Randy Mazey, West Virginia, a few years ago, came up with a proposal. Uh, they got some traction for a little bit, but then kind of flamed out. Uh, you know, John Anderson in Minnesota, who I'm sure Coach will talk about here in a second. John has always kind of had some wide-ranging ideas on, on what the college baseball season should look like. But uh, I think anyone who would read, uh, you know, this proposal that was kind of spearheaded here by Coach Backage uh, would agree that there was a lot of thought, uh, a lot of research, uh, and most importantly, a lot of very good points. Uh, Coach, just – just kind of how did this come about? I mean, I know John Anderson has been working on this for a while, but you know, obviously there's a lot of research involved here. Uh, how did this come about? And we'll also kind of get Aaron's uh, initial take on this proposal as well. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Um, you know, the concept of moving the season back is not a new one. It's been around for decades. Uh, you know, Coach Anderson has, has a, a long, successful career, been on a lot of committees and uh, has really dove into this concept uh, for a long amount of time and had a lot of great great ideas and supporting information. Randy Mazie's proposal uh, was was outstanding as well. But all of them, all of these proposals we've seen in the past centered around competitive equity and weather. And really, this came about because we've had something that we, you know, normally wouldn't have, and that's time. And that time has, has allowed us to see if moving the season back uh, is good for all of baseball, not just the Northern teams. It, obviously, you could just say, oh, this is good for Northern teams because of the weather. But in, understanding that the college baseball business model is not financially sustainable. In fact, it's a losing model um, was really the impetus to see, does this make sense for the warm weather schools? And using the, the pandemic and the crisis and the time that we've had to really do a deep dive into the data uh, and see uh, would this benefit and change the, so, so we've just changed that. Personally, the work I've done is just from the perspective of a warm weather coach. Uh, and that, that really is, is a critical point to clarify for the people that uh, are reading this, thinking this just benefits the North. The, the study was done uh, looking not only at, at at northern but mostly southern when it comes to the finances uh, and trying to take competitive equity and not even make that a topic so uh, that that's really what this started yeah. from this is understanding that in the post-covid era uh, schools are going to be looking at their business models as well and everybody's doing this self-audit to look to cut costs and and minimize expenses and increase revenues and we have to we have to for the financial sustainability and growth of our sport do the exact same thing so that's how this that was the the birth of this document yeah and real quick to kind of lead in with with kind of the fine details before we go to aaron uh the the, the most important thing here is, is the timing of the season uh as we all know the middle middle of february is when the season starts under this proposal it'd be the third week in march if you're looking at the college world series the college world series uh, would be in the middle of July as opposed to the middle of June as it is now. Uh, and this proposal is broken up in terms of financial sustainability, student welfare, uh, and, and academics. And, and Aaron, uh, you know, when when you first saw this proposal from Coach Back, it's like, what were kind of your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I've been in support of moving the season back for a long time, as you know, you know, hashtag push it back. I mean, this is Look, it's, it's the boys of summer. It's not the boys of winter. It, it, this is not a winter sport. You know, we start our season on Valentine's Day, and it's, it's dumb. It just doesn't make sense for baseball. It never has. Um, and so, for me, this is just common sense, and it's a breath of fresh air to see all the coaches uh, that aren't just, you know, cold-weather coaches that are coming around on this idea. Uh, some very important voices in our sport, you know, I reading your story today, Jim Schlossnagel and, um, you know, Dan McDonald and Tim Corbin are all guys who are, who are behind this, you know, and, and I love it. I love to see um, coaches thinking, 
you know, uh, I guess viewing self-interest differently. You know, if, if it's good for all of the sport, then it's also good for you as an individual, even if your program is humming along just fine the way it is now. So uh, that, that's my initial reaction. And, and here's something else you know, to, to, I wanted to piggyback on. You know, Coach, you, you talked about um, how we need to adjust in, in the post-COVID era. And, and I guess one thing uh, that this proposal does that I think helps a lot with that is you know, if, if you're starting the season in March instead of February, uh, it does reduce travel costs, right? Because you have so many schools that don't have to go away to Florida for, you know, the first month of the season um, to find games to play. I mean, I, I feel like if we're, if we're going to more of a regionalized model, at least in the short term, um, that would help ease that transition, don't you think? Well, there's, there's no question, Aaron, and that's been the feedback from a lot of administrators as well as this, this not just baseball, but all sports to – have more of regionalized scheduling, uh, decreasing those inflated travel budgets that we see in college athletics. Uh, and, you know, in a lot of this, instead of, you know, maybe not liking the result of these slash budgets of, of uh, cutting down our season, reduction of games and so forth, we, we just really wanted to get ahead and put something out there. The, the feedback from administrators has been positive because they're seeing the effort to contribute to the fiscal bottom line and and you guys are right you know playing baseball in mid-february to mid-march and this is where i've tried to remove my opinion and go to the data what does the data say and for southern schools for northern schools for everybody it has a significant financial impact simply because northern teams aren't spending a ton of money traveling getting on airplanes going to warmer parts of the country those warmer schools aren't paying large financial guarantees with a regional scheduling model. They're doing more home and home type trade-offs. Uh, and the, the fans, the fans, you know, a collegiate fan can only spread their energy so far. And it's basketball season. And these colleges with these marketing departments, they're marketing basketball season. And in the, with the exception of a few places in the country, it is not warm in February around most of the country. And the average fan doesn't want to go sit out there, let alone the players or the coaches want to be out there either. And the data supports that. The fans don't show up in February and March like they do in April and May. That's, that's what the information says. And that's what I wanted to present is just here's the data. Here's what it shows. And it shows college baseball does better in April and May as opposed to February and March. And that has a financial impact. People don't think about baseball season until it's major league season. That's when baseball starts. It starts in April. So if we can start our college season as close to that date as possible, it's better financially for our sport. Yeah, I mean, for, for people who don't know a lot about the scheduling in college baseball, here's kind of a, a snapshot of what Michigan's schedule looked like this year. It's, it's kind of the, one of the craziest schedules I've ever seen. They went out to Arizona opening weekend. They went to Florida the second weekend to play Connecticut, who they had played in Arizona on Sunday. And then they went back to the West Coast for two weeks. So it gives you an idea of, of how these uh, northern schools and these Big Ten schools have to schedule uh, early in the, in the season. Uh, Eric, one of the questions I was going to ask, uh, uh, to be honest with you, I've had three SEC assistants reach out this morning saying they totally support it. Uh, that's, that's very important for you guys. Uh, I put out a poll uh, earlier this morning on uh, Thursday. Uh, that has about a thousand votes so far with 70% of people being in favor of it. Uh, this is a fan vote. So we'll see what the total vote looks like, but uh, I've had a couple of non power five coaches reach out and say, you know, for these mid major programs, like how are we going to afford, uh, you know, you know, food and, and housing uh, during these summer months. And that, that's going to be a pertinent question about this legislation potentially, uh, you know, from these mid-major coaches, you've got to get the mid-majors on board. And kind of, what's your thinking process on just kind of the, the food and house, housing element as it uh, relates to not only the Power Fives, but also these mid-majors? They certainly seem to be a little concerned about it. Sure. And it's, those are valid points. And I've talked with quite a few mid-major uh, coaches as well, and they've expressed that same sentiment. And everybody has to run their numbers. You know, the numbers presented – uh, may apply to Michigan or the Big Ten in terms of what they spend uh, to travel early in the year. All the schools need to look at their data and say, what do we spend the first you know, four weeks of the season in our travel costs? And can we mitigate those costs and compare them to what it would cost at the last four weeks when we're paying the additional portion of 
keeping our players on campus, which we, we ran the numbers for, you know, we have freshmen that live in dorms. Everybody else has a 12 month lease. So the sophomores, juniors and seniors, it's a no budget impact, but it does cost us just over a thousand dollars per month per freshman to stay in the dorms. So that's a real cost. And then the food costs, you know, everybody's per diem uh, at their schools are different. We, we pay almost 150 bucks per kid per week. Uh, so those have, those add up. Uh, and then, uh, you know, pre and post game meals, everybody's gonna uh, potentially have the option to have more home games. Home games, uh, there is an operating expense to home games. I did the numbers based on uh, what it would cost for umpires, pre and post game meals, the cost of baseballs, uh, you know, those are all the things that I think coaches really need to take a, instead of just giving what they think are the estimates, actually get in there, dig in and, uh, and play around with the numbers. Some schools are going to find that they have uh, a surplus there. There's going to be the, those, whatever the saving is from traveling early is going to offset those costs. Warm weather, mid-major schools, they're the ones, if they don't draw much attendance, they have to see what their revenue is from their attendance and what additional home games offset those costs. There is absolutely going to be some teams where there's going to be an additional cost to keep their players on campus uh, that isn't in their current operating budget. And those are going to be the schools that are going to need to look at, you know, finding that money somewhere in their operating budget or fundraising for it. Uh, but those are, val those are valid concerns and valid points. Uh, but it's something that's unique to each individual school and everybody's budget is different. And so they're going to have to look at it, what their situation is. And it's probably worth noting too, that, you know, there's only going to be uh, so many schools that are going to be playing into July. You know, it's not like we need all 300 uh, schools in division one to keep all their administrators on campus in, in July. I mean, once, but once we get to, you know, past the end of June under this proposal, you're talking about, you know, the regional hosts and, and the super regional hosts, and then you're in Omaha. So uh, it's, it's a limited number of schools that are affected that long. Now you're still pushing things back a month. I mean, the, the month of June, that's typically a time when there aren't as many people on campus, but uh, it, it does not, you know, linger all the way through the summer. That's something that's important to note. Um, what about, I guess, the, um, <clears throat> when you're looking at objections that, that people commonly have to this kind of a proposal. What about, you know, the, the idea of fans, um, uh, student fans being able to attend games? That's something that I know Kendall's brought up a lot of times uh, is, is not having, you know, so many students on campus maybe could impact some of the atmosphere or attendance numbers. I personally think that that's probably an overblown concern because I think generally speaking, when you look at the bulk of your attendance, uh, like in, in a regional or super regional, You've got packed yeah. environments without as many students because it's you're drawing from the community and the, the kind of natural fan base that goes to your normal sporting events anyway. But what, what's your, your thought on that issue? Well, I, I think it's it, the target audience of baseball in general is, is families. And it's that's at the minor league level. That's at the major league level. And not to minimize student attendance, because I think every coach would love to have a great student section that was rowdy and you know, kind of the 10th man out there. And, and some schools have it and most don't. And again, this proposal is not a one size fits all, but it is a one size fits most. And we still would want the students uh, to, to, to come. And, and they still have that opportunity through the academic year. And hopefully the ones that are either live in, in proximity to the school or the ones taking summer school could still do that. Uh, but the, to make a generalized statement, the target audience for baseball are the families. It's the families with kids. It's, to, it's the general baseball fan. Those are the people that come out. And the data says those people come out more in April and May than they do in February, March. Yeah, you know, one thing I was going to bring up, and you, you and I have talked about this before, but the, the natural question a lot of coaches are going to have is, you know, summer camps uh, and recruiting. And, and both of these things were kind of covered in the frequently asked questions part of this proposal, which we'll have on the site a little later today. But uh, j just your thoughts on, uh, you know, just the recruiting calendar and how it fits into this. And also, you know, summer camps, you know, coaches will make the point that, hey, a year ago, we were all out here fighting for, you know, volunteers uh, to be full-time assistants. Now, you know, some of these guys that are relying heavily and even some full-time assistants that rely heavily on summer camps, in some instances, you may have guys that may go a month without being able to do uh, youth camps. So just your 
your kind of the, the, the group's thinking process uh, on those two topics, Eric? Well, I think, I think we need to think big picture long term here. You know, we, we spin our wheels sometimes and we get frustrated uh, about the volunteer situation. But the reality is it's going to be hard for an athletic director, especially in the post-COVID era, to, to say, yeah, let's spend more money on baseball when it already loses as much money as it does as a whole. Uh, so, you know, legislation for getting a third coach passed, a third assistant coach passed, if, if we don't show a way to improve our fiscal bottom lines and be more financially sustainable, uh, then, then we're going to be dealing with how are we going to run more camps to pay our volunteers forever. And this is a way, if, if we ever want that third coach or more scholarships, this is the next step. This is the way to get there, not uh, running the extra you know, fall and winter camp. Now we do that because out of necessity, uh, but if we're looking long-term and big picture, this is it. Uh, in terms of recruiting, I, I love to recruit as much as anyone. I mean, love it, love it, right? And that's just not legislation you can attach to a proposal like this or it'll never pass. Th those, those changes, you have student athlete experience committees, you have faculty athletic reps, you have all kinds of administrators that make those recruiting calendar changes. Uh, I would love to, you know, say, hey, you know, you can recruit whenever you want and there's no quiet periods, but that's, that, that would be my opinion. And I don't wanna make this about my personal opinions. I just wanted this proposal and this information to be about uh, what the data says and what the information is and what the facts are. So I do think the recruiting calendar, those are all things that are gonna come up and be discussed like RPI and like summer camps and like summer baseball. Uh, but those aren't things you can attach to this proposal. But I agree, those are things we definitely want to uh, look at in the future. So the timeline for this right now, it sounds like you're eyeing 2022. It'd be a pretty quick implementation for a dramatic change like this. Do you think that's that this has legs, that this could actually be our reality uh, that quickly? And, and do you think maybe this pandemic would kind of help us get down that road more, more quickly than maybe we normally would. I think this pandemic, Aaron, is put everything on the table. I mean, every, every thought that scribbled down on a napkin, I mean, everything's on the table. Uh, obviously, from an administrator standpoint, college football is most important right now. It would be, lo it would be ideal to say, let's put this in immediately. Uh, but when you're talking about a legislative process, uh, in the cycles and how when those committees meet and how legislation is formed, 2022 just seemed like it would make the most sense, uh, even though that would be considered quick for uh, something of this magnitude. But something of this magnitude is absolutely necessary uh, as schools are, are looking uh, for any way possible to be more financially responsible. The only way this passes in my opinion, this is my opinion, but this is also what administrators have told us. This has to be a joint initiative among the coaches, brought forth by the coaches, not any third parties, not, any, not one conference, not one school. Uh, this has to be college coaches coming together for the betterment of the sport. And that's the only way this thing will have legs and will have traction. And the, that's why uh, in, in talking with the coaches that we've talked with, all the guys that were quoted, as well as uh, some some coaches on the West. Um, these aren't coaches who need a, a change to have successful programs, but these are coaches that are looking at the long-term sustainability and growth of our sport. Well, have you have you been surprised at all by the number of kind of SEC slash ACC coaches like Dan McDonald and Tim Corbin guys like you just mentioned? They don't need a change in the season to be successful. Uh, have you been a little surprised at how many guys have actually been for this? No, honestly, because, you know, th this is one of the, those proposals, the rising tide raises all ships, but the, the, the elite programs are still going to be the elite programs because of the people that are running. Uh, you know, the, the, those programs will still be successful. In fact, they may, they, they, I think they really stand the chance to benefit with some of the SEC schools looking at their attendance data in particular and just seeing when, how they get increases in their fans you know, the one thing, the one piece of data that, that I don't have and probably will never have access to is what is their actual attendance 
you know, I can watch their games on Synergy. Yeah. And I can see it doesn't look like 7,000 fans there. You know, those are the paid season ticket holders. What is their actual attendance? And that has implications to concession yeah. revenue, merchandise revenue, and so on. And it, the administrators know that. And they, they're crunching those numbers and they can see that that's an additional revenue stream for some of those big schools that do draw really well. They'll have a chance to uh, make even more money uh, just by playing later in the year. Yeah, one and of I the think, other things I was going to mention real quick, too, is, uh, you know, arm care. Uh, one of the really interesting things about this proposal, we'll, we'll put these these graphs out on the site, but, uh, you know, you talked to Dr. James Andrews just about, you know, arm injuries and things like that, and whether it's like hip injuries, knee injuries, arm injuries, and professional baseball. We, didn't have, we don't have the data for college. I don't think any of us do. But for Major League Baseball, a lot of those injuries were very early. I think it was within the first, like, 50 to 80 days of the season. Uh, what was the conversation like with, with Dr. Andrews on this proposal? Because obviously this, this would be a, a, a bonus, a plus for, you know, players in terms of their health. Well, Dr. Andrews is the foremost authority on, on throwing arm injuries in the world, right? Certainly in our country. And he, uh, is a, he, he is such an advocate and speaks with such conviction on the overall health and, and wellness of, of, you know, of all players from pro professional down to amateurs. You know, in those charts, they show you know, that there is this massive spike in professional baseball and injuries, especially to the throwing arm. Uh, during the ramp time, you know, those 50 to 100 day scandal, those are from when the calendar year starts. So that's like spring training. And then right after the major league season starts is where those gigantic spikes in injury, especially to the elbow and shoulder are happening. And you're right for college baseball, because of HIPAA laws and privacy, we can't reveal that data or show that data, but it's, it's a real problem. And we only get five weeks of ramp time two of those weeks being reduced hour, eight hour weeks, and only three weeks of official team practice before the start of the season. Yet we have this extended period in the fall where we're doing player evaluation and scrimmages and exhibition games. That just seems counterintuitive. Those need to be flipped. And we need the bigger ramp time from a safety standpoint leading up to the start of opening day. Yeah, and it's, you know, anyone who's been to a college baseball opening weekend um, even in the South in Florida, I, mean, I remember going to the, the Big East Big Ten Classic in Clearwater one year and, and just freezing my butt off. I mean, it's, it's wintertime everywhere. It's not just wintertime in the North, you know. I mean, I've been snowed out for opening weekend here in, in the Carolinas. I remember one time UNC and UCLA were supposed to play a series uh, in Chapel Hill, and they had to both fly down to Orlando um, and meet on a neutral site on short notice because of snow. And they got down there, and it was cold there, too. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, that's an important thing to remember is, you know, it's really the weather is a crapshoot everywhere. And, you know, cold weather is, is bad for, for pitching. We've seen this, you know, over and over again. The data backs it up. And, and then you factor in the lack of lead time as well. I mean, as much emphasis as the NCAA has placed on uh, student athlete welfare in recent years, I seems like that's driving a lot of the changes in college athletics. And, and I feel like that's kind of a no brainer here. I mean, we, we need the season to move back for that reason alone i mean forget about everything else that's a great place to start it is a great place to start and you're right you know the the student athlete impact the academic impact with missed class time those should be enough uh, to stand alone uh, but now that you you see the financial implications of of this these are the reasons why college baseball is not sustainable and it's look at the starting time of our season uh, now it really becomes a, a no-brainer in a lot of people's minds there will obviously be some people that, you know, will want to, you know, poke holes in it, but they'd poke holes in anything. I think if everybody looks at the, the, the grand scheme of this proposal and the long term, uh, not, only, not only the short term impact, but the long term impact this could have for the growth of our sport, aligning our season more with the professional season. Uh, th there's another jump. I mean, we, we have made great strides as a sport, but there's a a quantum leap level that we can continue to make. And this is a step in the right direction. What is, uh, Eric, I guess looking forward, like what is the next step? Uh, I know the NCA in January is going to kind of attack the, the transfer legislation. Are, are you guys kind of hoping to get uh, all your ducks in a row to the point, whether it's with the other coaches, the ABCA or whoever, to where this could actually potentially 
go in front of the, the, the NCA D1 Council at the convention in January? Yeah, so the first step is the coaches. And, and again, for this to have real traction, it needs to be a joint initiative among multiple conferences. If, it, if it's just the Big Ten, well, it's, it's you know the Northern coaches again complaining about the weather. If it's just the SEC, people think, well, the rich are trying to get richer again. But if it's everybody, if it's, if it's multiple conferences from Power Five, from mid-majors, from all parts of the country, it's college baseball coaches coming together. We're not going to get everybody, but if we can get the majority and those coaches go to their ADs, you know, ADs have said they're not going to push this on a coach who doesn't want it. So getting the coaches these informa this information uh, so they can go to their administrations and then getting some ADs after the coaches are on board, getting some ADs, some maybe some prominent ADs to champion it uh, would be an outstanding next step. Uh, getting people involved at the conference level uh, that work in the commissioner's office and, and some high level people in that regard would be fantastic. Uh, and then it's the administrative and legislative committees after that. Uh, you'll have faculty athletic reps, you'll have uh, university presidents, you'll have a, there, there's such a process to get um, legislation of, of this caliber approved. Uh, but the very first step, the one that we're focused on right now, is just our coaching base. Well, here's hoping that uh, th we can wrangle these cats quickly. I know that's not always easy when it comes to getting college baseball coaches all aligned on something. But it seems like there's a, a, a pretty wide base of support for this to start from. And, uh, and you know... Uh, I'm curious how, how it goes as far as uh, getting people to publicly sign on on this and how quickly you can get them mobilized. That's going to be fascinating to watch over the next couple months. Well, you know, you, you guys play a huge role in this too. So thank you for, for getting the word out. And, you know, uh, like you said, uh, you guys said, you know, you'll attach the, uh, the PDF information to it and people can read the full thing and, and uh, make their own opinions. But I do think that when, when people digest the, in, this in its entirety and start to understand, you know, maybe get over their, their knee jerk reactions to, you know, playing baseball in, in you know, post season in July uh, or starting the season in mid March, but actually start to look at what the potential benefits of those decisions are. Uh, it's, it's an easy proposal to get behind because you see how it benefits so many people, especially the student athletes. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm one of those people, uh, Aaron will will tell you that uh, in the past, I've not been a fan of moving the season back. But uh, And I was skeptical when you told me about this, but when I started diving into it, I, I really liked the idea. So uh, I do hope it passes. Uh, what, what's been the feeling uh, from the West? Uh, I've heard from SEC coaches already today. Obviously, Big Ten coaches are in favor of this. Uh, some Big 12 coaches are in favor of this. Uh, but we haven't heard a lot from the West. Are, are you getting a sense that the West is kind of – uh, I don't know about this. Yeah, I think so. I think I think they're uh, not to speak for them, but uh, they're, they're probably looking at this and uh, trying to see how it how it fits, um, you know, in w with their demographic, you know, and I'm from the West. I, I grew up in California. So I, I feel like speaking about the West is, is something I can do intelligently. And I don't want to sound like some Midwest coach just making comments about the West, but I grew up there. And, you know, when doing the data and seeing that no California teams average 2,000 fans a game, but yet minor league baseball is doing just fine in California. In fact, you've got some teams that are, are doing outstanding. The Sacramento River Cats and Fresno Grizzlies averaging seven, 8,000 fans a game. And then you have a bunch of teams, even Stockton and Modesto and Lake Elsinore and Lancaster and Rancho Cucamonga and the Inland Empire uh, teams, they're averaging over 2,000 fans a game. And I, I understand the West hesitation of thinking that all of a sudden something like this um, is going to make a significant impact to their attendance. It, 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 may, it may not. I just know it's not going to hurt it um, based on the data. And seeing how some of the big schools out in the West, how their attendance increases as the season goes on, I do think there, there would be generate a lot more interest. But those are the decisions those schools will have to make. Um, a lot of those conferences, um, 
you know, they're, they're, they're not uh, spending a ton of money traveling the first four weeks. So for them, it's lining up their budgets and seeing what it would cost for the semester schools to uh, house the players or to, to, to pay for the extra costs of those players staying on campus for the schools that operate on the semester system. There's a lot of schools out there that operate on the quarter system so they would not have any additional costs to keep the players. They're going to be in school anyways. You know, the benefit for them is they would be playing their first postseason, not in school. Um, so there, there are a few advantages for the quarter schools in that regard when it comes to uh, no additional costs uh, to keep the players till the third week in June, if that's when their uh, school year goes anyways. Uh, but for the mo for most of them that are semester schools, they'll have to run those numbers and, and see if they can make it work. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think you would get support from those northern states in the, in the Pac-12. I mean, I, I've covered uh, Arizona State and Oregon State uh, and Arizona and Oregon the same weekend a few years ago. I think it was the middle of March. It was the first weekend of Pac-12 play, uh, and it snowed on me walking to the ballpark. So I can't imagine these schools like Oregon, Oregon State, Washington, and Wazoo – and, and most certainly Utah, I can't imagine those schools would be against this idea. No, I, I, I can't imagine they would either, and I don't want to speak for them. Um, but, you know, you've got some pretty influential coaches in, in Southern California and, and uh, Arizona. And so, you know, they may have to go to more of a, if they're worried about the heat, you know, they could play at night. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. They just would have to see if it makes sense for their program. So I'm, I'm optimistic because uh, I do think, you know, there's, there are some coaches that have said, you know, this, I talked to a, a coach in, in Southern Florida uh, and said, you know, we actually would do where we're located. We, we actually get a better crowd in March, uh, but this isn't the best thing for college baseball and it needs to be done. You're here. Well said. Any final thoughts, Aaron, to close us out? No, I mean, I, I just wanted to thank um, Eric for joining us and for all the thought and care that went into this proposal. I mean, I really think you covered everything that, that needed to be covered and more. Um, you know, you, you covered all the objections that someone might have to this thing. And it's just, yeah. it's just so rational the way it's laid out and it makes so much sense. And you, you guys really worked really hard on this thing. And, um, you know, tip of the cap to you. It's really well done. Well, yeah, thank and, you guys. You know, thank you guys for pushing the game forward. I don't know where college baseball would be without the two of you and D one baseball. So thanks, fellas. Yeah, one last thing. As I said earlier, we will have the the full PDF of this proposal on the site uh, to kind of take a, a gander at the entire uh, product. Is is like I said, it's pretty in depth. A lot of research done. Uh, you know, we've all had a lot of time, Eric, during this uh, pandemic. So. I do applaud you for taking the time to do all the research on this proposal. I know you've got a lot of Zoom calls scheduled for this afternoon, so we will let you get to that. Uh, but keep us posted on just the progress of this proposal, whether it's with the coaches, uh, with these different uh, legislative committees in the future. Uh, keep us posted. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you.